the right tends to assign too much agency and the left too little. I think they both tend to assign much too little. I think especially there's been a move on the right to start assigning less agency. As social pathology has spread to the white population, then suddenly, oh, wait, now there's something to this idea that it's society's fault that you are drinking too much and beating your children. It's like, um, no, like you, were, you had it right the first time. Welcome to Acton Line, a podcast from the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. This week for Acton Line, we're bringing you a debate from our recent Poverty Cure Summit entitled, Who is to Blame for Poverty? and featuring Brian Kaplan and Chris Arnotti. Acton's Biennial Poverty Cure Summit provides an opportunity for participants to listen to scholars, human service providers, and community leaders address the most critical issues we face today that can either exacerbate or alleviate poverty. Rooted in foundational principles of anthropology, politics, natural law, and economics, participants gained a deeper understanding of the root causes of poverty and identified practical means to reduce it and promote human flourishing. As a professor of economics, Brian Kaplan has published in the American Economic Review, the Economic Journal, the Journal of Law and Economics, Social Science Quarterly, the Journal of Public Economics, the Southern Economic Journal, Public Choice, and numerous other outlets. His book, The Myth of the Rational Voter, Why Democracies Choose Bad Policies, from 2007, was published by Princeton University Press and named, quote, the best political book of the year by The New York Times. Chris Arnotti is a freelance writer and photographer whose work has appeared in The New York Times, Atlantic, Guardian, Washington Post, Financial Times, and The Wall Street Journal, among many others. He is the author of Dignity, Seeking Respect in Back Row America. He has a PhD in physics from Johns Hopkins University and worked for 20 years as a trader at an elite Wall Street bank before leaving in 2012 to document addiction in the Bronx. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash podcast. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Matheson Miller. I'm a senior research fellow here at the Acton Institute. And on behalf of the Acton Institute, I'm delighted to welcome you all to, again, to the 2022 Poverty Cure Summit. Um, we, this, is a, a, this year, we're doing a hybrid online event. So we have people online from all over the world who are watching, and we also have a live studio audience. Um, so after the, uh, we'll have some conversation with, with our panelists, and then we can take questions uh, both from online. You can, you can submit them through chat or hear uh, a live audience. So if you have questions as well, we'll have mics to go around. Um, I, for those of you just joining us, I've talked a little bit about Poverty Cure. And at the center of Poverty Cure's idea is that this is the human person, that the human person is at the center of the economy, and that human persons are not simply gears or machines to be moved around. Uh, but oftentimes when we think about poverty, we can tend to objectify poor people. We can turn poor people into objects, objects of our pity, objects of our compassion, objects of our charity. And we can socially engineer them and try to like solve their problems instead of um, <clears throat> treating them like the protagonists of their own story of development. And so these are the themes uh, of, of Poverty Cure and at the Acton Institute. So I'm delighted to have a, a panel today, uh, our final panel of the day, is a debate discussion, It'll probably be some discussion, hopefully a good debate as well, between two really fascinating, uh, interesting panelists, Chris Arnotti and Brian Kaplan. So very brief on their, bi on their bios, Chris uh, is, is the author of a book called called Dignity. Um, is it Seeking Respect in Back Row America? Yeah, Seeking Respect in Back Row America. And we'll explain, he'll explain what the difference between the front row kids and the back row kids are. And um, you're probably front row kids over here. <laughs> uh, and um, Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at George Mason University. Also, Chris has a substack called Chris Walks the World, uh, where he, he walks the world. He goes and he spends time walking through cities and meeting people and talking about them. I highly recommend it. Uh, Chris Arnotti at Substack. Stack. And Brian Kaplan is a professor of uh, economics at George Mason University, um, a, a originally Californian like, like me. Um, I would give you Brian Kaplan's all the books that he's written, but that would take up our time. So I'll just tell you that some of his 
latest books include Don't Be a Feminist, The Case Against Education, Labor Econ Versus the World, Selfish Reasons to Have More Children, and Why Politicians Are Evil. How evil are politicians? How evil Question are mark. politicians? <laughs> yeah. See, so Let's he, not prejudge things. Yeah. So he's not pro, he's not he's not provocative in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so delighted to have both uh, Chris and and um, and Brian here with us. So why don't we why don't we start? One of the things you're working on now, Brian, mm -hmm. is a book called Poverty: Who's to Blame? Mm -hmm. And the the theme of this uh, this panel is Who's to Blame for Poverty? So um, why don't you like maybe quickly? since you tend to have these provocative moves, why don't you make an argument? What do you think, in, if we look at the United States today, and we think about poverty in the United States, which is different from poverty in the developing world, who's to blame for poverty? What do you think? What I say in the book is there's really three things, at least. Of course, probably more than three things. Uh, the first thing I talk about is immigration restrictions in the first world, because if you could just leave poor countries and get a job in a rich country, you can almost instantly solve your poverty if you're an able-bodied adult. I talk about bad economic policies, which we see especially in the third world, although also to some extent in the first world, uh, for example, for housing regulation. And then again, the last one I talk about is irresponsible behavior. Uh, this is the one almost everyone wants to keep talking about. So even if I give a talk where it's 95% about bad immigration policy and bad economic policy, the remaining 5% on irresponsible behavior gets almost all the questions. Uh, I don't back away from that. Uh, but yes, there's been some very common sense research just looking at why people end up poor. And one very strong result is, it is you, know, you don't need to be a genius to avoid poverty in America. You don't need to be a superstar. You don't need to go and cure cancer or develop a vaccine or found a business. Really, all you need to do to have a very high probability of avoiding poverty is simply finish high school, get a full-time job and don't have kids until you're married, and that pretty much solves the problem. Uh, this would not be true in poor countries, but in the U.S. it really does seem to be true. So, Chris, you, you um, in your, your book, uh, Dignity, you argue that oftentimes the, and correct me, of course, if I, don't, if, I don't, if I misrepresent you, but that oftentimes the right tends to give the poor too much agency, and the left tends to give the poor not enough agency. And that what you found in your, in your like, real life long engagement uh, with people is that uh, there's, this, there's this tension here that their dignity and their agency is not respected, uh, and nor are the challenges that come to them. So how do you re maybe talk about that and perhaps respond to, to Brian's Be Before I, um, I just want to say, um, I'd rather have this be a discussion than a debate because you're probably like the debate champion of your high school. <laughs> <laughs> I wish. And, 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 I, and I, was out, I was out smoking dope in the, in the parking lot. <laughs> um, yeah, I wasn't. But, um, but thinking about um, poverty in the U.S. in particular, is I, I guess my kind of glib answer is, you know, we, um, we, are, all, we are all to blame. For poverty, because you know, if we think about poverty in simply an economic framework, we could solve poverty today. We could just give people money um, and get them above the poverty line, raise taxes on the rich, give people enough money, and we would have solved quote the, the kind of the, the definitional um, poverty. But I think what we're talking about here is kind of more what you would call um, dysfunctional behavior, um, and I guess the way I look at it is I look at everything within the context of. I look at things at a cultural perspective, not you know, so much as an economic perspective. So if I see somebody makes what he would say is irrational, reckless decisions, I ask, why did they do that? And often it's because it's a product of where they grew up. It's a product of not having enough information. It's a product of, if you think of culture as a tool, toolbox that you, you're given, um, <clears throat> their toolbox is very different in many cases. People have very different toolboxes, and that's partly the product of where you grow up. If you are in, a, in a, an environment in which um, reckless decisions are kind of glorified or done often all the time, then you're more inclined to do reckless decisions. If you don't know that there are reckless decisions, you're more inclined to do reckless decisions. Um, but I would also say that there also comes a point when you start to, ha you start to ha have to ask, why are people making reckless decisions? Because I, I probably disagree with Brian in a bit. Is I, I think in some senses, people are behaving rationally in the sense that they're, 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 they're maximizing their utility function. They're, they're making a decision which reflects how they view the world. And I view poverty as um, kind of not an absence of economic value. I think in the US, certainly, we, we have a lot of stuff. 
Um, and um, so people are filled with stuff. What they do not have is a lot of central meaning. They don't have a will to live. They don't have a reason to live. And addiction is the, the one I think, the, mo the one that I'm most familiar with, the most reckless decision. Addiction is a form of suicide. Um, and humans are the sole animal that, that kills himself. And that's a damning thing to do is to kill yourself. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty damning statement on, on, on how you feel about the world. And the fact that more and more people are, are killing themselves and willfully ingesting drugs that they know will kill them speaks to that they, they themselves have an emptiness. They're driven to kind of this, this reckless behavior by a feeling that they don't have any, there's no point being here. They're not part of something larger than themselves. So I kind of, I, I'm give, I give people more the benefit of the doubt because, you know, uh, the idea that if you, if you want to understand somebody walk a mile in their shoes, you know, I, I certainly haven't walked in their shoes, but I've sat at McDonald's with them <laughs> for, for more than an hour. And I, I, I generally, there is people, you know, there's, I'm not going to completely dismiss the idea that people, there's different behavior. There are some people who have very different behavior. But um, I, I do think that you have to look at the broader context in which people make their decisions. Brian, you want to? Wow, yeah, sure. I want to say a lot of things. Um, <laughs> he was so, the yeah, champion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so first of all, I don't think that it's true that the right tends to assign too much agency and the left too little. I think they both tend to assign much too little. I think especially there's been a move on the right to start assigning less agency. As social pathology has spread to the white population, then suddenly, oh, wait, now there's something to this idea that it's society's fault that you are drinking too much and beating your children. It's like, um, no, like you, were, you had it right the first time. Uh, it is a beverage. You do not have to put it in your mouth. Uh, and furthermore, like sort of the idea that uh, these ideas are alien to communities like this, that's just not true when you read ethnographies of poverty. It is totally standard for parents to be telling their kids, I don't want you to make the same mistakes I made. They are mistakes. The teachers are telling them these are terrible mistakes. Don't do it. Look at where it ends up. It ends up in my, in my situation. And then kids don't listen anyway. It's not like they didn't hear any other view. It's that they cared more about what their peers were saying than about what the people that actually had experience were saying. Again, as to what's going on, um, you know, I, 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 for me, it always comes down to this. You know, like, um, you, did you have a reasonable alternative that, you know, to not do this thing? Right? So you know, someone says, well, someone is holding a gun to my head, and that's why I had to kill that person, because if I didn't kill them, they would have killed me. Like, that's a pretty good excuse. On the other hand, if your excuse is, they would have made fun of me if I didn't do it. That is a terrible excuse. It wouldn't get you off in a war crime trial. Right, uh, and, for, and a good reason, too. Right? It shouldn't get you off on a war crime trial. Uh, so anyway, uh, I would say that the, you know, if we think of this as something only that an outsider would say, then you, it's easy to dismiss it and say we're all to blame. But I say, look, it's not something that only an outsider would say. People who are embedded in the communities they all, who have had experience, they see it with their own eyes, and they don't take these same excuses. So why should we? Um, Brian, further on that, you, you've kind of made the argument that there's also a move you, to, uh, in both the left and the right um, to say, well, the elites are mm -hmm. the source of my problems. Mm -hmm. And I, why don't you develop that a little bit mm -hmm. as well? So, I mean, first of all, it's a totally unconstructive attitude, even if it's true. <laughs> right? So it could very well be that the like, elites have messed everything up for you. It's like, all right, well, so now what should you do? Should you go and take heroin because the elites are bad? That is a terrible response to that situation. Uh, my colleague Tyler Cowan has this uh, parable about a banana subsidy. This is one where the government subsidizes bananas, and then people store piles of bananas on their roofs, and then the roofs collapse and they die. And it's like, if only the government had not passed the banana subsidy, they'd be alive. Yeah, but also, even with a banana subsidy, you probably shouldn't have been putting the bananas up on your roof. Uh, it's just not a good idea. Uh, now, in terms of the extent to which elites really are to blame for things, uh, I would say that you really need to take it case by case. Uh, for housing regulation, where I'm wrapping up a book on that, I think that elites very are heavily to blame. Often they're local elites rather than national elites. But nevertheless, they are pillars of the community saying, oh, we couldn't possibly allow you to tear down this wonderful colonial house and replace it with a skyscraper that will house 1,000 people. That would just be a disaster. Right? That's more of an elite thing to worry about. In the case of immigration restrictions, which I write about a lot, I think that is you know, not so much an elite thing. I think elites tend to be on the side of more immigration. And that's where I will say, all right, well, the elites get some things right, some things wrong. Um, so I guess that's where I would go with that. Great, thanks. Uh, speaking of elites, Chris, 
Um, <laughs> after smoking weed at school, uh, Chris did a PhD in physics at Johns Hopkins. <laughs> and then worked as a bond trader on Wall Street for 20 years. And um, one of the things that you, you've said, Chris, it's, and you can maybe talk a little bit about this, uh, but you began to take these walks, and you went to Hunts Point in the Bronx, and you spent a lot of time there. And one of the things I've heard you say is the problem of poverty is really not so much the problem of the poor, it's the problem of the, the rich and the elites because of, in a sense, the things that we value. Now, you differ from Brian on that. Do you, yeah. you want to maybe talk about that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, going back to a point you said earlier, which was, um, you know, it's not like they don't have these values in these communities. But those values are being eroded, and they're being eroded by the elites. Like, so if you, if you look at, like, the kind of things that give people a sense of, a sense, we replaced what I would call, call local regulation, family, um, place, um, church, with government regulation. And so when we decriminalize something like marijuana or we, we, we legislate away, kind of um, you know, make it e no, easy divorces and all these things, we basically, when, when, when the government is the sole moral regulator, when you, when you actually de, de, deregulate something and, and, and make it legal, that's a moral claim to, to, to many people in the working class. That's like, okay, you, it's okay now. It's, it, it's no longer profane, it's sacred. So there, what you have in these communities is a real absence of regulation, self-regulation, that comes from, that basically come from the top down. And so what, what, what I would say to, to Brian in some senses is I think there's a, I call it a justified cynicism within, within these communities towards authority. Um, it comes from the fact that every, every body that's ever, every, all their dealings with um, authority figures, and in that, in that they see that's, that's schools, that's um, guidance counselors, that's police, that's um, voting, um, that's the DMV. Um, and it's mostly the legal system, everything is negative. All their interactions with authority figures is basically being scolded, being, being, um, being, up, being, um, being wronged. You know, you, can, you, just, you spend time in, um, in, in poor neighborhoods and you see how, how the interaction between police and, um, and kids go. It's, it's not, <laughs> I, I don't want to demonize the police because the police are in a no-win situation. But the judicial system crushes them. And it's, it's, it's something that they have, they come, it's a, it's, a, it's a soulless bureaucratic system filled with fluorescent lights and linoleum floors that gives them nothing but problems. So there's this, there's this real antagonism between the government and, um, and kind of the authority figures that breeds what I call a justified cynicism that leads in many cases, again, I'm not saying they, got, they, they had bad experience with the judicial system, therefore it's okay to be an addict, but the, the, the path from there to there is understandable if all you've, been, all you've seen is systems that kind of degrade what you believe in. And that includes a lot of our economic policies, which, you know, they, they, you go into Northside Milwaukee, which um, has, um, from 1940 to 1980, the, the black population went from about 100 people to about, you know, 20% of, of Milwaukee's population. They came for the jobs in the factories that were in, in the north side. And those, those, those factories produced a, st a stable neighborhood because you know, the, the father could go get a job. Um, they used to say, you, if you get fired from one place, you just walk across the street and go get another, another job. And it allowed them to, 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 to put their economic house in order so they then could put their, their, um, their, their family in order. And actually, um, when, when those factories started moving overseas, the deindustrialization, that completely crushed the neighborhood. Um, and so into that vacuum came dysfunction and um, economic collapse and then dysfunction. Families fell apart um, and the, their whole source of identity w w was changed. And, you know, and so it was, a very, it, was, it, was, it was crushing to who they were as people. It took away their sense of meaning and it left a vacuum. Um, and one of the things I've talked about a lot is, um, you know, I think it's hard for people to understand why some people use drugs. But if you walk into a drug trap at 2 in the morning or you walk into um, a crack house, it's a community. It's a welcoming community. Now, 
for all these viewers, don't do drugs. I'm not encouraging you to do it. But you, un you understand that there, it's a place that people are accept, accept you as who you are. And you find, you find a community. And what, what people want in life is a community. And that's where they're going to get it sometimes. So um, I can tell, Brian, you want to jump in here. <laughs> but before, before you do, can, I'd like to maybe ask a question that, that challenges you a bit. Chris, how would you respond to this? In one sense, you, you, you make, a, and again, put it into your, your own words, but you, you make, a, I think, a very important claim that what we've, a lot of what's happened in what Augusto de Noche calls pure bourgeois, like the shift from Christian bourgeois, where um, the commerce has a place but embedded in the larger concept of, of higher values and transcendent values, has left, everything becomes transactional. Um, and that we've ignored these transcendent values of place and family and race and, and, and um, uh, communities. And so that, that we have this deep cultural problem. And yet, it also sounds like you're making almost an economistic argument that, well, if the, if the factories hadn't closed, everything would have been fine. Um, how would you respond to that critique? Um, I, I think, you know, they're, they're interchanged. You, you need economic stability at some level to, 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 to allow yourself to, to build a functional society. You know? And so what, 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 what the old jobs did, at least in, in places like Northside or Gary, Indiana, was um, it allowed somebody without credentials to have econo enough economic stability all they had to do was get out of high school, if that. You go to Battle Creek, Michigan. Battle Creek, Michigan is a perfect example. It was where they make Kellogg's. Um, you know, I remember talking to a couple in Battle Creek, Michigan, and, and the guy literally walked out of high school onto, onto um, the Kellogg's, Kellogg's uh, factory floor and had a job for 40 years. And that stability allowed him to build, build a life. And I remember talking to his wife, and um, she said, um, you know, I asked, I, when I interview people, I ask them how old they are. And she's like, um, you know, she was like 76. I'm like, you look really good for seven. She goes, well, I yeah, am. Yeah. And she goes, uh, yeah, I, 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 I said something offhand. She goes, I'm glad I'm not any younger. I said, what do you mean? She goes, I wouldn't want to be a young person at this point. I, I see what my grandchildren face. They, you know, Kellogg's is gone. Post is gone. Um, they've downsized. And my kids are working jobs where they, they don't, they're running around gig to gig. And so they can't build their grandkids, and so they can't build that stable life. And for someone to actually say, I, I wouldn't want to be young again, meaning you're facing the, you know, you're 76 years old, you're saying, like, if I could take a pill, I wouldn't want to be 24 again. That's a damning statement for how, you know, how, how things are. So I think you need the economic stability as kind of almost like a first principle. But after that, you also need, you know, my biggest pushback against, um, against kind of the field that Brian's is in, Brian is in, and not necessarily Brian here, but is I think that we, we, we look at things far too much in economic terms. We, we, we adjudicate decisions, policy, by is it going to increase the GDP, is it going to increase our efficiency, without looking at what I'd call the externalities, is how, how, how is the community going to be affected? Um, how is um, how's the family going to be affected? And so uh, I think when we look at policy a lot, we, look, we tend to look at things like non-economic things like, well, you just, place doesn't matter much. If a factory is here or if a factory is here, it doesn't really matter. It matters a lot to the people in this town if the factory is here rather than here. <laughs> it matters immensely. It's, it's like, it's so much, it matters so much it's like removing one of their, their arms. If they have to, if they, if they, if they, two generations from Appalachia or two generations from Selma, Alabama, and you're telling now, now you have to moved to New York City, that, that's, that's, a huge, that's part of their identity, and that's a big cost. Yeah, and as you say, that's different from what you call the front row kids who are moving is a normal thing. Now, I, I studied debate uh, moderation. I have a PhD. debate moderator? I was a champion. I actually would. I, I was he needs more time. Uh, I, I was a champion debate moderator, and so I learned this uh, technique when you have uh, Dr. Brian Kaplan. You just go like this, Brian. <laughs> a lot of the arguments that Chris makes seem plausible when he's telling them to you, but if you just imagine being in a dialogue with a person in the situation and being another person that knows them, I think they really just don't feel plausible at all. 
Just imagine that you were the mother of a teenager who is hanging out with a group of people that are using heroin. And you say, why are you doing this, son? He says, well, you have to understand, Mom, there's a great community, and I feel like I'm part of it, and people need community. It would seem ridiculous. Say, like, no, you don't. It's not a good community. It's a terrible place, and there's plenty, well, plenty of better options. I can tell you five right off the top of my head. And then if the teenager says, yeah, yeah, but I don't want to go to the church group. I don't want to go to the library group. I want to hang out with the cool kids doing drugs. That's where it's like, okay, so the first thing you said is really very little to do with what the actual problem is. It's more of you are being defiant and difficult and don't want to go and do the thing that makes sense because you're a difficult, impulsive young person, which is also not constructive, but it's true. Uh, so now when we're thinking about how hard it is to be poor in America, I have written about immigration, and I am very fond of this argument, which is not popular, but it's still very deep. That is, well, the immigrants seem to be doing fine. The immigrants go and cut ties to their community. They go to a totally new country. They might not know the language. And somehow they go and they find a job for themselves. They find a place for themselves. They raise their families. Their kids turn out well. Why can't you do the same thing? Now, again, this might not be the most constructive way of putting it, but in terms of understanding what's really happening, I think it's very illuminating. Uh, and it shows really like it's much more about personal virtue and or, or, yeah, or you could also say the family itself being important rather than this amorphous thing of the community, uh, which is really just so broad and vague. I mean, honestly, so while it's true that people need people, the value that you get out of immediate family, close friends is so much higher than that of just I need to be in a society that's really friendly and supportive. Um, if you just remember that the world has a lot of introverts who barely have any, so any you know, they just know a few people, and that's plenty for them. Right? So now, the introverts don't talk much. Right? They don't go and tell you their stories. They're not eager to say, hey, let me tell you one thing as an introvert, and then go on for 10 hours. But they are there. They're a large part of the population. So if you just look at them, you can see they don't seem to need community all that much. As long as they've got a few family members, one or two friends, they feel contentment. Uh, now, for someone who's more extroverted, you may say it needs to be broader. But again, for someone who says, look, there's a problem in my community. It's a deep problem, and this is just totally hindering me. And that's not only is it uh, unconstructive, it's just not true. It says, well, why don't you go and try to find like, two more friends? Wouldn't that take care of most of the problem? It's doable. And they don't have to be heroin addicts, actually. They could be friends with jobs who are conforming to the success sequence. Right? And then you could hang out with them, and that would be a, a big enrichment to your life. Why don't you try doing that? Again, that sounds kind of like being a scold, which uh, Chris doesn't like. Um, um, so you know, like, as to right, like, the right tone is different from the right point. There's the true thing to say, and then there's the right way of saying it. I'll confess, I've just specialized in trying to say the correct thing. <laughs> right? And I know I need to improve on saying it in the better way, although I also feel like there's a division of labor, and if I just say it like it is, <laughs> then there'll be one of you will be listening and will say, okay, that's the way it is. Now, how can I make the, what is palatable to others? And I will thank you, and I say, thank you so much for taking what I said, which was correct, but totally inert because people wouldn't listen and getting people to listen. I mean, I guess my, my thing is, as someone who spent a lot of time in these communities, um, I, I just have a lot more empathy with people who, and understand a lot better. I, I understand, I, I, I don't justify it. It's not a justification. It's not a moral approval of people who see, who are, who are surrounded by depressing situations, who are sur surrounded by um, uh, limited options who um, are being told um, directly and indirectly that they're losers um, because um, you know, of, of their situation, uh, I, I understand where people turn to, 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 to different decisions than what Brian may want them to do or I may want them to do. Um, I think the, the, um, there's a, there's a you know, and to the point of, you know, I, I, I would, their mother wouldn't speak to them the same way. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, there's not family members around. And I think one of the um, real issues here is that we've devalued the family to, to the point. Where, I mean, I used to be a scientist. And so uh, when I went into work in these communities, I didn't want to find, I didn't want to become a classic right wing scold saying family, 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 family. But you go into these communities and within two weeks, you're saying family, 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 family. <laughs> I mean, you need strong functional families. 
And in a lot of these cases, we don't have strong functional families. And we can argue about why that is. Um, but without the regulatory family to, to have the mother tell the kid, don't do that. Um, without, um, and so all they, all, the only person telling them is, is a, you know, a don't do drugs sign from an institution that they have no respect for because that institution has provided them with nothing before. Um, without the churches, um, to add a moral framework, I, I just don't see in, in, in this kind of, what I would call a libertarian hellscape, where it's all about the economic and nothing about the communal, that you can expect people who, in a libertarian hellscape, that we, we, actually, um, we actually are proud that we reward winners with more than they deserve and proud that the losers suffer. Um, that you can't imagine that when you go to the bottom of the, of the, of the ladder that you're going to find people who are making reckless decisions. I, I just, you know, I think we've created a situation that is just, is, you know, we've created this ruthless meritocracy, so-called meritocracy, and there's only one ladder out, and that one ladder out is the educational system, and the educational system is stacked against them. Um, I, I don't see where you can't have some empathy with the people who are at the bottom who are told because, we, because with just enough hard work, you can make it out. The flip side of that is if you're at the bottom, you're a loser, and it's your fault. Um, I just don't see how you can look at the, those people in the face and tell them that, you know, you just need to work a little harder. I mean, I mean, I just like some of the people I'm, I'm thinking about, if I had told them just to work a little bit harder, you know, <laughs> I would have felt like an asshole. <laughs> I mean, just point blank, because that just they're, they're in a trailer park in the middle of uh, middle of uh, Appalachia or they're, a, you know, a black kid in Gary, Indiana, surrounded with empty lots and barbed wire. And I'm supposed to tell them just to work a little harder. So, Brian, I'd like to move here to education in a minute, where you both actually uh, we agree have some, on that oh, one. You agree on that one. But before we go to education, just besides the education part, do you want to give one more response to Chris as the comment there? And then, then I'll restart us on education. Uh, sure. So I'd say that when we talk about empathy, it's worth remembering there's a lot of people in the world, and of course a lot of people in poor neighborhoods. You can say I have empathy for the drug addict or the alcoholic. How about empathy for the family of the drug, drug addict or alcoholic? I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I definitely put myself in the shoes of that person first. All right, the shoes of a person where you know, they're supposed to be taking care of their kids, and instead they're spending the family money on alcohol. And they say, look, what am I supposed to do? And what you're supposed to do is stop doing that. Right? It's a beverage, and we're your family, and we should become far before the beverage. So still, and, and you say, well, that's, like, that's so easy for you to say. A lot of people do stop drinking. A lot of people do stop using drugs. It's not a pipe dream. It's something that happens routinely. I mean, it's actually very common just for people to age out of even very severe addictions, uh, you know, which it is a bit surprising, but true. Uh, there's a famous study of Vietnam War veterans who came home. They were heroin addicts, and almost all of them stopped using as soon as they got back to the U.S. It's like, yeah, well, now I've got something else to do, so I guess I don't need to be an addict anymore. Uh, it is just surprising how strong the power of choice really is. Um, now, again, just to go and say, well, in this hopeless situation, it makes sense that people would do this. Say so it really does not make sense. Uh, I agree that just saying work a little bit harder is going to be totally unpersuasive. I mean, honestly, giving any kind of unsolicited advice of any kind to anyone is almost totally unpersuasive. You need to wait for the person to want your advice. Right, so people come to my office looking for advice all the time, and um, you know, of course, not most of my students. Most of my students never come to my office, but the students that come, they want some advice, and I usually start by asking them some questions about what they want, like, well, what is your career goal anyway? And they tell me things, and I try to listen and say, okay, well, sometimes I say, like, wow, that career is so far from what I know, I don't know that I could help you. But other times they say, uh, yeah, well, I want to learn how to manage a textile factory in China. Will the PhD in economics help me? So he's like, yeah, no. Uh, no one here knows how to manage a textile factory in China. We would not be uh, capable of assisting you in that. You should really look in a different place. So you, know, you do need to wait for a person to want some advice before advice is helpful. But I mean, I will say that I advise a lot of young people, and I think I do know useful things for almost everyone. Um, like, you know, I, I will say this is probably one of the things that being a dad has done more to me than anything else, which is just to convince me that I can help anyone if they will listen. Uh, now, getting them to the point where they want to listen, that is difficult. But yeah, like if someone wanted to listen and they said, well, gee, I'm in a really dis a distressing situation. I really hit this is a really bad neighborhood. I've got the barbed wire. It's scary. And I say, yeah, that sounds really terrible. But you know what will not work? 
becoming a drunk. Becoming a drug addict is totally unhelpful for, for getting out of the situation. I guess I, I start with, like, well, do you want to be there forever? No. And I say, well, like, do you know anyone who's not in that situation? Almost everyone in that situation does actually have some relatives, sometimes close, sometimes distant. They're not in that situation. And you say, well, so what are they doing differently from what your family's doing? And they'll say, oh, yeah, well, they did the following thing. Say, well, emulate the people who have the job that you want to have. This is like my standard advice to anyone. Even if I don't really know much about the job, I'll say, well, do you know, is there any, like, who are the people that have the job that you want one day? So, okay, talk to them. That's my advice to you. Stop talking to me, talk to them. And, yeah, and then I have some additional things like get people that are not that much older than you because if you're 20 and you want to be a professor, don't talk to the 70 year old professor. His advice is just out of date. But talk to the 20 to 28 year old professor. He can probably tell you a lot about what's going on. How can I be like you? Reverse engineer it. This is useful advice. I'm not saying that if I just went to the people in Chris's book and said, hey, reverse engineer things, well, yeah, but they're not going to listen to me. It's still damn good advice. It's just, if a person isn't ready to listen, then it won't work. I think one of the other things that a lot of people underestimate is um, how um, how uh, fragile the tightrope is to walk in these neighborhoods to get out, to quote, get out. Um, you, the, 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 the judicial system, the educational system, um, all these things, and, and then the community itself, um, the peer pressure and things like that. If you, if you slip up, you know, it, it, it can be a very much easy cascade down. So you almost have to walk the perfect tightrope out. Like this is a very, very narrow path to get out. And you have to be perfect all the time. And a lot of us are never perfect all the time. No one of us are perfect all the time. So, you know, I, I, you know, I, I remember when um, the New York City had this awful policy in the, um, during the, um, uh, I guess it was um, Bloomberg era. It was a stop and frisk policy, which um, police would basically just, and, and I was around it often. Um, so you just see, I was just walking by, uh, walking through Hunts Point with a bunch of friends, friends of mine I mean, who don't look anything like me. Um, three cop cars pull up, grab them, throw them against the, grab them, throw them against the, the, the wall, frisk them. And um, I'm a smart ass. And had anybody done that to me, I would have lost my cool in a second because these kids didn't lose their cool. They couldn't lose their cool. They knew they couldn't lose their cool. They lose their cool, then they're just then it's just a cascade down. I couldn't. I, you know, if I woke up one day and I was kind of frustrated, annoyed, and a policeman came up and and I remember when I was taking I remember taking a picture of one of the policemen doing this, and he said, "Stop." I said, "Actually, I have the right to do this because no, you don't." He says, I'm going to charge you with, if you, keep, if you take that picture, I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm, going to, I'm going to arrest you. I said, for what? He goes, whatever I care to, I will. I'll just make something up. And I'm like, <laughs> I, that, I, you know, I, at the time I was like 48 or 50, and I was, you know, I was counting to 20 in my head. Don't, don't lose it. Don't lose it. If I was like 18, I would have lost it. And so I think you know, the idea that exercise self-control is, is wonderful but you're tested. Your self-control is tested over and over and over, minute by minute. Um, the, the neighborhood and the, and, and the forces that, rule, that kind of both from within the neighborhood and from out with outside the neighborhood, you're tested all the time. And, it's, and, and I, I do know there are kids who follow Brian's advice who do make it out. I go, when I go into these communities, I spend time in them. Um, and like the, the, the community colleges, people who actually who walk that tightrope. And they're wonderful kids. They're absolutely wonderful kids. I give them all the credit in the world. But it's easy not to be one of them because they, they have to be perfect to get there. And I don't think few, few of us can be that perfect. All right, can I, I, I just real, real quick? Yeah. And all this perfection stuff that is a gross exaggeration of the truth. Standards in American high schools are really low. Most, you know, if you're in a high school in a, in a bad area, like just showing up and trying to do the work, you're going to finish with almost certainty. And of course, there's plenty of colleges with very low standards that'll be happy to take you. Uh, you said you wanted to move on to the education system. The idea that we have a system that is totally unforgiving is almost the opposite of the truth. It's one where it's ultra forgiving. It's true you're not going to get into Harvard. And Harvard, you may very, very well have to be near, near perfection, especially if you are white or Asian. But uh, nevertheless, the idea that normally you have to be perfect in America in order to avoid the worst outcome is just totally wrong. 
Okay, so let's, let's change direction. Uh, you talked about housing um, as a, a problem. So we've talked about the kind of the personal responsibility element. Um, you've talked about then there are policies, Brian, mm -hmm. like how like how difficult it is to build, and this makes this has doubled the cost and sometimes mm -hmm. quadrupled the cost, mm -hmm. I think, right, of, oh, yeah. of housing, uh, which of course uh, affects the poor. Um, another, two, a couple of other areas are the are the criminal justice system. So maybe we just spend a, a short time on the criminal justice system because you brought it up, and then we'll go to education. Um, Anthony Bradley, who is a, um, a colleague here at the Acton Institute and a professor at King's College in New York City, uh, wrote a book on overcriminalization, And he responded to, I think it's Michelle Alexander's book called The New Jim Crow. And he said, she had argued basically that, that policing was, was racist. And, and Anthony said, he said, did, started doing the studies, and he said, well, see, it's not racist. It's really based on poverty. We over-criminalize and we over-police the poor. Um, and this is another obstacle. So um, let's begin, maybe, Brian, what do you think about that argument? Do you think that, that holds, um, like housing, there are certain there are institutional pressures that, that are maybe unjust or unfair to the poor, like housing would be one, right? Because if you're wealthy, OK, it's fine. Uh, how do you respond to that? And then Chris. I mean, what Chris was saying about the police being damned if they do or damned if they don't is relevant here, because if the police were to say, all right, fine, we're not going to go into poor neighborhoods, people would not say, oh, great, thanks. Instead, they'd be complaining, well, apparently you don't care about the well-being of poor crime victims. The problem is that most crime is intra-group, which means that if you are in a poor neighborhood, you are protecting poor victims from poor criminals. Of course, in the real world, there's also a bunch of innocent people who wind up getting caught in the crossfire both ways, both getting arrested even though they were doing nothing wrong, as well as, of course, getting hurt when they were not involved in crimes. Uh, so, I mean, I would generally just focus on things that should not be crimes at all. Say that's where we really should focus. Rather For example. than yes, uh, so you know, I've long been an advocate of drug legalization. I think that it has a lot. You know, it, it's it is a a good idea. It's one that people often have hard uh, have a hard time swallowing. Say, well, fine, it could work for marijuana, but what about other things? Uh, you know, there isn't time to go into the full argument for it, but I think that the analogy with alcohol prohibition is very strong and really worth taking seriously. So that would be probably the biggest one that I'd be thinking about. Okay, Chris, let's go quick through this because I want a couple other topics. I yeah. know it's super complex, so yeah. I'm asking you to do really hard things quickly. Okay, um, so... And can you explain to us the Big Bang when you're done? <laughs> he actually did study the Big Bang. That's yeah. not a joke. It, it, right. it's, it's a Bible dressed up in math. <laughs> <laughs> Genesis dressed up in math. Genesis in math, okay. <laughs> That's your Twitter answer. Okay, yes, sir. Um, so... Um, in terms of... Uh, I do think... I, I think, I, I, I think the... the, the the focus on the, co the po cops being bad is a mistake. It's the judicial system that's bad. The cops are in an a, 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 a awful situation, as Brian said. Mm -hmm. Damned if they do, damned if they don't. I think they're being asked to regulate, to, to, to deal with situations that should be dealt locally, but aren't being dealt locally by the family and by the community. Um, and, um, so, and I think um, uh, I, I would disagree with Brian in the sense that I, I think if you believe that these communities, if, I, I understand Brian believes that these communities are filled. Poverty is a lot about lack of self-control. Why would you why would you legalize drug in a community with people who, are, who lack self-control? I think you're just that's just that's that's going to cause chaos. I don't believe um, addiction is about a lack of self necessarily just about a lack of self-control. But I do believe if you if you if if the government is a sole arbiter of what is legal. Um, of moral acts as the sole arbiter of what's moral, then once you decriminalize something, you make it, you actually approve its use. And I think that's very dangerous in this community is to take away any stigma about using drugs. I think drugs should have a stigma associated to using them. That's kind of the community way of controlling um, kind of uh, the behavior, making it harder to, go, to do what I said people often do. Um. So there's, I know a lot. We, we I think you get all. Yeah, no, I don't know. Did you want to say one more and pretty quick thing just about, like you've talked before about how you think that, uh, how did you explain it? That um, oftentimes wealthy people will just get away with things that oh, poor yeah, people I mean, don't. I, I, just think, I just think that um, uh, the quip the I used to say is that, um, and, and I do agree with Brian that um, the, the, the system is not is, is stacked against the poor. poor not just the, not just uh, it's not a racial situation. It's, it's much more about class. Or, uh, you, Anthony Brown. Yeah, 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 it's much more about class. I mean, the, 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 um, but in terms of um, again, it's just it's, it's it's kind of a it's both a kind of a 
economic plus a cultural issue, which is just, there's a lot, like, um, I used to say that poor people, pe rich people make mistakes, poor people go to jail. Um, like, um, w w you know, find, give me the person I can find the crime. Um, the libertarian view, I believe, is that we have way too many laws, way too many laws and regulations which affect poor people. And so a policeman can always find something they did wrong. And when that happens, that cascades into, into, into usually um, uh, uh, the criminal courts far more than it does for wealthy people. All right. So. Once Chris said the libertarian view is right, Brian finally nodded. <laughs> and uh, let's move into, uh, into uh, other uh, areas of agreement, and that is education. So, um, uh, Chris, you've, you've written about like, how the back row and the front row, and that really the educational system is stacked against, against the poor. And Brian, you have made the case against education. You think it's just a waste. Uh, for, 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 unless you maybe make it into a certain elite area, mm -hmm. it's more of a signal than it is anything else. Mm -hmm. So why don't you make the case against education, and then, Chris, how you can talk about how you see that, especially uh, impacting, impacting uh, poverty, and both of you speaking about poverty especially. So in slogan form, most of us think about education as being kind of job training, a course, economists think of it that way, but also parents, teachers, politicians. We think about schools as places where you go and we take immature children and we turn them into hardworking, able-bodied adults. Right? And I say, it's, you know, while we think of education as being job training, it's much more of a passport to the real training, which happens on the job. It's a passport to the real training that happens on the job. Uh, what's going on, I say, is you, know, you definitely learn some useful skills in school, but just not that much. Most of what you study, predictably, you will never need to know after the exam. But it still makes sense, given that we have this ranking system for employers to say, well, I've got 300 applicants. I might as well throw away 270 from people with the weaker credentials. You know, even if you were to say, well, aren't there going to be some good people in the 270? Yeah, but I'd have to interview all 270 to find those good people in the, that group. Whereas if I go and limit myself to the well-credentialed people, then I am going to spend a lot less time trying to find out, uh, to, to, you know, spend a lot less time in fruitless interviews. So I think a lot of what's going on with the education system, I'd say a majority of it really, the main reason why education pays is that we have a system where you go to school and you get a stamp on your forehead. Now, what's the problem with this? From the point of view of the individual, it really doesn't matter. Remember I was talking about finish high school? This is advice to an individual. Now, this does not mean that if we would just get everyone to finish high school, then we would solve our problems. Uh, rather, what it means is that if everyone had finished high school, employers would then raise their expectations about how much education you need to be worthy of not having your application thrown in the trash. Uh, this is what's called the problem of credential inflation. There's overwhelming evidence that there's been massive credential inflation over the last century. Basically, the job that you have probably could have been obtained by your parents or grandparents with years less education. Right. There are a few jobs that, uh, that have spread that become common that do require more years of training, like in tech. But most jobs are not like that. Rather, for most jobs, it's just that to be in the running, you need more degrees because other people have more degrees. Uh, for society, this is very destructive and wasteful. A uh, you know, really simple way of thinking about it is this. Would you rather be a high school dropout today when it's like the bottom 15% of educational attainment or a high school dropout in 1945 when that would put you in the bottom 80%? Right, so you know, I guess it would be like 75%. So yeah, like in 1945, only about 25% of Americans had finished high school. So the stigma against someone who hadn't finished high school was very small, which meant that there were lots of job opportunities for you. Of course, we generally think about our system as being great for the poor because if there is a highly talented poor student, we roll out the red carpet for them, and we really do. But what about the siblings of that highly talented poor student? They, pro they are dealing with a system where they're not likely to get the degrees and then opportunities they would have had just to prove themselves by working on the job and moving up are just much less than before. So I think we, anyway, we have the system where there's a lot, we've created a system where there's a lot of social pressure to get an enormous amount of education. For most people, it's super boring and pointless. If you just say, yeah, well, super boring and pointless intellectually and practically, but socially it's very useful because it's the way that you get a good job. So, all right, well, thanks a lot. I'm 13. I don't really feel like doing another nine years of drudgery in order to get this better job after graduation. 
Um, also, of course, we have greatly devalued vocational education of all kinds. Uh, you probably heard of in Germany and Switzerland at that age, there's a test. And if you don't look like you're going to become, you know, that you are academically very gifted, then they try to train you to be a mechanic or to be a plumber or an electrician, which really bothers Americans. They're like, you're giving up on that kid. Right? So the chapter on vocational education in my book is called One is Greater Than Zero. The meaning is it is better to prepare a person for one practical job than zero practical jobs. Preparing a kid that does not like school to be a professor is just ridiculous. Right? And again, for athlete, there's a kid who dreams of being a professional athlete, but he's mediocre. All right, when he's six, you humor him and say, yeah, yeah, you're going to be the next all, all, you know, most valuable player. But if there's a kid who's 16 and he can't even get on his high school baseball team, it is cruel to keep telling him, oh, you're, gonna, you're so great, you're going to become a professional baseball player. There is a point where you just have to be honest and say, all right, maybe there's like a one in a million chance that you, things could turn around for you, but if that doesn't happen, how about we think about your plan B? And yet, while we'll do this for athletics, we really don't want to do it for academics, and we should. Chris? I mean, I can almost agree with completely all that. All right. Um, um, I would say that... <laughs> um, I, I would probably be a little bit even harsher on um, the system. I think what we do is, um, uh, in my book I write about, I think the largest division in the United States is, is, is not class, it's not race, it's education. And so that's where I come up with the front row, back row um, idea. And you're seeing that now in, the edu in, in how we vote and things like that. And you can see it very strongly in marriage. So the classic sociologist measure of whether two groups are the same or separate is whether it causes social, di social dysfunction or social angst if they intermarry. So you really can see yep. the intermarriage rates between people with bachelor's degrees and people without are super low. So right? it, it is like a cast. Yeah, and it very much is. And um, so in my book, I argue that the, the greatest division in the country in the country is, is education. That's where the front row, back row metaphor comes from. Um, and the front row is basically me. Everybody up here, actually. <laughs> um, but it's people who have lots and lots of credentials. And one of the things I've always find very find frustrating is um, some people did books similar to mine, you know, because who were focused on talking about my book. At, um, in many ways, was focusing on the, the opioid addiction, the addiction um, um, issue. And so I get sent other versions of that book by other people. And one of the things I find very frustrating is solution. The solutions that are proposed in every other book is we need to make these people like us. We need to give them education. They need to go to, you know, like they need more, more and more education, more education, more education, more education. I'm like, no. The problem is that we have the addicts themselves. No, 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 no. Okay, the kids before before the problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not so crazy. You know, like Nick Kristoff says, the way the way to solve this problem is is we need to we need to we need to they need to be more like us. You know, we need to prepare them to be op-ed writers. They need to be prepare them to be lawyers. And and like, no, absolutely not. What you need to do is understand that we need to provide alternative ways of living a meaningful life that don't require college. Um, not everybody is a college-bound person. Not everybody has the aptitude or necessarily the interest in being in college. They may not have the, you know, in, in Brian's case, I think it's just, you know, the idea that self, self-control, whatever you want to call it, they don't particularly have that in them. They don't want to be that person. And we, we've kind of built this kind of kind of just oppressive system that funnels everybody into this one size fit all college bound system um, where you know you you should feel guilty if you don't like Shakespeare. I don't like Shakespeare. Like why why does everybody have to feel guilty for not liking Shakespeare? You know, I mean I, I think he I think it's not even weird, Titus and Dragon. It's just this weird language, man. Like I don't want to weird it. Like so we, we, we um, but like we, 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 we funnel everybody into this one kind of kind of one size fit all concept. And that's being done by the case system, by the people who, who at the top who can't imagine a success that doesn't include what they did. What do you mean? I, 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 I became the geography B ca captain of my school and then I went off to, you know, blah, 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 debate team. And then, but you know what? There's a lot of people who that's just not who they are. Do you think it negatively affects boys? Even yeah, yeah, more because yeah. that seems to be a real problem. Like mm -hmm. boys, especially with like later development and and so, a host of things. So, you, so I mean, th th those there, there there are those people in those communities who are going to come up and become professors. Yeah. Of, you know, and that's great. You know, and I when I meet them, I tell them, you know, you go for it, and I, you know, you do that. But it's it's the other people who are made to feel like losers if they don't 
pursue that path. And so I think, you know, the trade school thing um, is huge to me, and um, because, you know, there's almost this meme on Twitter because when I do talk about the biggest division being um, education, I inevitably get the professor of philosophy who's adjuncting <laughs> in New Orleans who says, well, I'm working class because I only make $30,000 a year. <laughs> and I'm like, you don't, you yeah. have so much cultural capital, man. You have all these options. Yeah. You chose this path. <laughs> yeah, you still marry a lawyer and no one will say, oh, heaven <laughs> forfend. <Yeah. laughs> like, um, so, um, you know, so the, 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 the people, the people will quote in the back row and one of them, you know, seeking respect is kind of the, the they know they are felt, they are, they are considered a second class. And you have to, and so what I was saying is the trade schools is, you know, that person will get and get mad that the plumber makes $120,000. Mm -hmm. And you would think that somebody would say, ah, <laughs> being a plumber is the right decision. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? um, so uh, I'm going to get to questions from the audience, but I have, um, Chris has a great line that this will, this is, I'm selling his book here. He has a great line. He says, I went to Huntsville, uh, the Bronx, uh, an atheist and a vegetarian, and I came out. Uh, going to church and eating McDonald's. And, and one of the things that you, you talk a lot about is, is faith. Um, and, and so I, you have 30 seconds to tell us. Um, you have 30 seconds to tell us about that, that sense of like what your experience or I'll give you a minute on that distinction, how you kind of came in and what changed you of seeing it as like almost like the opiate of the people or a functional thing to something that mattered and why. Yeah, I mean... I walked in, I used to be a scientist, as I said, and so when I walked in and I saw that people, I went into these communities where I thought there, should, there would be no faith because these people are suffering from the worst, and I found immense faith. And so my first reaction was, ah, faith is important. It's, it's kind of like the crutch that they need. And then over time, I realized that how condescending a view that was. What in fact was happening was these were people who were living lives that put them in some senses closer to the evidence for God because they understood, they understood mortality in a way that I think wealthy people don't understand. We, 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 we who are wealthy, we who are very educated, have a hubris that we can solve anything, including living longer. So we, 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 you know, we eat right, we do all these things, and we can live longer. But people who live in um, rough situations, I think, are closer to the evidence for God because they understand the, that, that quite, quite a, 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 in many cases, um, being a human is about being a, a true human is being about being humble and knowing that we don't have it under control and we can't solve everything. And so I, I now say that basically, the, the reason the reason there are faith in these communities is is not as a kind of a a, a pragmatic solution that they need to, to a crutch, but it, because in many ways that we the wealthy ones who are living lives that hide us from the evidence for faith and evidence for God. Okay. Well, by the way, so real yeah. quick on housing regulation, not only can we get <laughs> the price of housing way down, but guess who's going to build that housing? It's going to be almost all non-college males. Uh, this is meaningful work. It's the kind of work that it's similar to working in a factory. And ways is actually maybe better because you actually get to see yep. the, that, you have, that you have constructed this thing. So, and remember, this is an enormous industry already. So if we could just double this industry, it would make an enormous difference in terms of providing uh, a, a, a economically sustainable, realistic economic alternative. Whereas protectionism is really just about reviving some industries that have died anyway and where we can just get it cheaper. But for housing, on the other hand, it's something that we totally need, totally can do. So it is just one, the, the, such a missed opportunity. When or it will be until moderate. my book comes out and changes everything. Right? All right. As a professional okay. moderator, 15 seconds. So what I would say to that is um, people way too, talk too mu way too much about the dignity of work. Um, the only place where dignity is, where you actually get dignity of work is when it's a craft, when it's something that you actually are, in, where you are in control of the process. And that includes things like carpentry, that includes things like um, auto work, that includes things, that is not working sales necessarily. And I, people who work sales, I look, God bless them. It's, it's, it's hard work. What I'm saying is dignity of work comes from someplace that, where you actually are involved in the process of making that. That becomes who you are, and that's generally craft work. Okay, so um, there's one more debate I wanted to get to, which is free trade. Um, but we don't have time because we have some questions. Uh, so um, why don't we start with a question from 
from the audience. And there's the question. Who has the mic? Okay. All right. Well, that mic is getting passed around. Raise your hand if you have a question from the audience. We'll get you a mic. And here's a question from, on, uh, uh, from some of our online viewers. Um, <clears throat> is there a way out of poverty that doesn't include moving out of low-resourced communities? Brian? I mean, there's definitely a way. There's so many different things you can do. I would, I mean, like, I would definitely say that moving away is one of the most obvious things to do. Say, well, like, where are there jobs that you want to do that are out there? Uh, if they say, like, I really absolutely have to stay here, then I guess the next question would be, all right, so who in this community do you know who has the job closest to what you want? And talk to them and find out how they did it. Question. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I, first of all, I just really enjoyed your back and forth debate from very different perspectives on such a challenging issue. So thank you for that. Um, one fact that uh, I want to bring up and see if you guys res respond to was that in the local area, I think of Native American communities or others where I've read and seen in research that right, the most predictive element of being impoverished is your zip code. Mm -hmm. So then you have to stay in that community. You know, For people in that community, there is no way out. How do you explain that if you're just saying it's more of a choice? Hmm. You know, I guess I would say that you know, if there's a poor zip code, the people that want to go and get out are probably going to leave the zip code, and then they won't be in the zip code anymore. It uh, doesn't show that there's no possibility. Uh, I mean, it, it would say that you've got to be flexible. Sometimes I have a student who says, look, I really, really want to get a better job. It's got, I need to be a professor of you know, geothermal dynamics, and it has to be in the D.C. area. And that's like, OK, that's going to be a tall order. If, you're going to, if you want something that specific, then there's probably not going to be a lot of opportunities like that. So yeah, like, you know, always start with cast a broad net. I mean, like, if there's something that's a deal breaker for you, then we'll have to work with that. But I would say that, uh, that you know, like, you know, if someone really wants to stay in a, in a, in a very specific community with, no, with very low opportunities, then yeah, their, op op their options are going to be poor. Although even there, I would always say, all right, let's figure out the best thing that you've got right here. And again, the best thing normally is to ask the person himself and say, well, who are the people that you personally have seen that have the job that you want to get? And also make sure they're not that old. Right? You don't want to get someone who's so old that their experience is irrelevant. And then say, on, let's, let's, loop them in on, let's loop them in on this conversation. Or maybe it's like, I'll pass you off to that person, because all I can do is tell you that I'm not the right person to talk to. All right, Chris, we're almost, almost done. Your final comment. Um, what would be the question? On this question about moving and like Native American communities, this zip code being kind of a, this limiting thing. It does um, have to be fast. I'm sorry because I think we could go another hour uh, with these with these gentlemen. Um, but I mean, I, again, I think that I, I think it's bad policy if we're asking people to be economic immigrants in their own country. Uh, I think that's just like I think we've 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 we've, we've built a, a country that I don't think is is the right way. Okay. This of course leads it, us it now. Always was that way though. The U.S. has always been a place for people moving around. That's the whole way the frontier gets settled is people saying, hey, things aren't that good here. Is there something else better someplace else? It's not the end of the world to have to move. Right? I mean, like, like some people don't mind at all. Some people actually like it. I mean, like first question is, well, do you even like this area of the country? No. Well, guess what? I got good news for you. There's other places that you probably like better. Let's, <laughs> okay. let's, let's find one you like. All right. So I'm sorry. I wish we could keep going, but <laughs> I have 28 seconds left. And so thank you very much. Uh, if you want to stay here, if we can convince them to stay to the people who are, are here in person, I think maybe they could take up more questions. But to those watching online, thank you very much for taking the time to join us for the Poverty Cure 2022 Poverty Cure Summit. Um, <clears throat> next one is 2024. And uh, please come to Acton.org, PovertyCure.org, and look at Acton On Demand. We have a lot of uh, uh, information where you can watch those things. So thank you very much, and, and have a great day. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Combs.